Hey everyone, uh, Ryan Welch back with part two of how to protect defense critical infrastructure. You might be asking yourself why are you dressed up so fancy? I'm out here in DC actually this week. I'm actually coming to you from my hotel room. Excited to be here with everybody. Um, I've spent 17 years working on the operational technology side, mainly in the federal government, but also in the commercial world and some national lab work. Um, have a long history working in the space. Actually started out as an Air Force officer uh, building rockets for Department of Defense, so uh, launching launching satellites up in orbit. Um, that was like 15 years ago. So um, yeah, excited to be here with everybody. Um, last time we talked about how do you sort of assess networks, part one of how do you protect defense critical infrastructure. Today we're going to be talking about part two, like how do you select the appropriate security control. So with that, let's let's jump right in. I'm going to pop my presentation up here on the screen. Hopefully uh, everyone can see that. Last time we talked about visibility as part one. How do you assess your networks? How do you get visibility into the assets that are in the operational technology side? Historically, you've had a lot of visibility in the IT assets, but in order to protect defense critical infrastructure from cybersecurity threats, you have to have full visibility into your operational technology. These are the cyber physical systems where you have control systems controlling physical processes. Think of a military installation where you have facilities across an, an entire military installation. In command and control, you, have, you might have facility-related control systems. You have backup power, fuel distribution, fuel storage. Um, there's a bunch of physical processes across defense critical infrastructure that are controlled by computers um, and control systems. And these systems are susceptible to cyber attack just like IT systems are. So today we're gonna to be talking about part two of what kind of security controls um, and what approaches you should take to protect these specific systems. And primarily we're gonna be talking about how do we close the door to the adversary? So how do we reduce the attack surface of these specific assets? Um, there's different ways you can normally go if you're, if you're talking specifically about asset management. Um, that's one use case, like how do I manage my assets across the enterprise? But we're going to be talking more about cybersecurity. How do we reduce the attack surface to these physical assets? And we're using a military installation to represent defense critical infrastructure. Last time we said step one was an enumerated list of devices, right? Most of the Department of Defense has been rock walking around with uh, clipboards and spreadsheets, but they're moving towards automating the process for developing these lists of process logic controllers. You might have a Rockwell PLC, a Johnson Controls PLC, a Honeywell PLC, depending on the specific operational technology uh, environment. But the first step is to develop that asset inventory like we talked about, develop that list of devices that are on your network. And in order to close the door to the adversary, you can't just know what the control system is. You also have to know who's the vendor, who's the, who's the model, who's the firmware. Because unless you know the firmware on the specific device, you can't determine if there's a vulnerability that's uh, against that system. But just because something is vulnerable doesn't mean that as a security professional, you need to do something about it. Um, uh, also, your solution should be able to tell you uh, if your system is end of life. There's a lot of control systems that are legacy across Department of Defense. And so you, you likely have control systems that are end of life, meaning they're no longer supported by the manufacturer. So if there was a vulnerability that was being exploited in the wild, there, there's no longer patches for that specific systems. That doesn't mean you can't do some things to mitigate the risk to those specific assets, but knowing if that asset is end of life helps you determine what kind of approaches you could take to mitigate the security risk to that specific system. So once you have that full asset inventory and you've determined is that system vulnerable or end of life, you have to focus on <clears throat> identifying um, which of those vulnerabilities have the highest likelihood of being exploited. You need to basically take a risk uh, prioritized approach because as a security team in an operational technology environment, there aren't always maintenance windows to be able to fix those. Um, those systems may or may not be important to, to the mission itself, right? So you have to, and, and as a security team, you have limited resources. Um, it's difficult to get after everything that's vulnerable. So if you, if you apply a risk framework, to systems that are vulnerable, then you can get after the things that are most important, right? It just gives you, as a security team, a prioritized approach to focus in on what's most important. So to do that, uh, Clarity uses this kind of risk framework to evaluate 
system. So once, once we've gone in and we built the full asset inventory, then we don't just say, oh, there's a vulnerability match for that specific device. And there's something called the, the vulnerability scoring system that will, that will you, once you've identified an asset, it will rank that vulnerability as critical. But just because you have a critical vulnerability doesn't mean that you should do something about it. You need to also ask questions like, is this specific control system mission critical? Or under accessibility, is it in a location that it can communicate with other assets that are mission critical, right? So just because this one isn't mission critical, if it can access parts of the network that are mission critical, that's also important in calculating the risk for that specific vulnerability on that system, right? Is it in a zone, right? So when, when you deploy a solution into that environment, it should be able to tell you these devices normally talk to each other. That means if it's in this location talking to this device, and when it communicates with that device, it has a possibility to spread infection, that's also something that you need to, to consider in your risk calculation. And then also, have you seen that specific threat being exploited in the wild? So um, when you have all five of those factors, you can develop a comprehensive risk score that will tell you these are the vulnerabilities that you should get after. Um, and there's some, there's some leading edge thinking that's, that's coming out here in the near, near future too, called exploitability predict predictability scoring system that will even do a better job of matching vulnerabilities to what's being exploited in the wild. So uh, as, as a team, you need to focus in on those assets on your network that aren't just vulnerable, but that also have these risk factors that are considered as part of it. So um, th when you take that approach, that helps you focus in on reducing that overall attack surface for your operational technology networks. So that's that today, just, just a quick, Quick talk. That was really what I, what I wanted to talk to you guys about today um, was how do we get after reducing the attack surface uh, based on a prioritized risk-based approach. So this kind of methodology, this thinking really helps you focus in on those assets that are most important to apply mitigations to. The other piece that I didn't really talk about is how do you protect against threats um, to the network? And maybe we'll do a part three to talk about that. But since it's just a quick talk, just want to share that with you. I really uh, appreciate everybody uh, joining me today. Hopefully this was helpful. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn if you want to discuss any of this further. And also you can check out claritygov.us if you want to learn more about Clarity Solutions. But I love having discussions too. So if you want to hit me up on LinkedIn, I'm happy to jump on and chat with you about any of this stuff. Um, and obviously this is really just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more here, but we just want to leave you with some quick sound bites, some things to think about, and hopefully this gets you moving down the right path. Well, thanks everybody. Really appreciate it. Uh, look forward to the next one.